That's really fun. I want to say welcome to the One Church and welcome to those who are watching online. Glad you are with us. And as Andy would say, as I saw a lot of his intros in the last couple of days, he would say, welcome, welcome, welcome. So, welcome. <laughs> Glad you're here. Um, I want to just tell a little bit about myself so we get a, uh, you understand who I am. Uh, again, my name is Eddie Shigley. I teach at School of Theology and Ministry at Indiana Western University. Any Iowa grads out there? Thank you, one person. Appreciate it. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, it's a great school. <laughs> Try it out. Um, and then uh, uh, one of the things too is uh, I come from a I come from a large family. I mean, it was, it was a really difficult uh, family background. Uh, I I uh, man alive. I am the youngest of seven children, and the reason why my family background is so difficult is, hang on a second. I got I got to compose myself. I had six older sisters. <laughs> Hand me downs are really bad. <laughs> so uh, uh, now I have, a, I have a great godly family. My parents were awesome. The professors at IWU for a long time. And so I am the youngest of seven kids. I met this incredible godly woman at Indiana Wesleyan and discovered that she is seven, number seven of eight kids. And so people are always like, oh, yeah, you know, we started dating on June 7th, 1987. We uh, are engaged September 7th, 1988. We were married January the... You guys are sharp. How did you know that? <laughs> January 7th, 1989. And uh, everybody's like, dude, seven's your number? Like, you've got to have seven kids. We're like, what? No. Mm -mm. As for crazy people like our parents, it's not going to happen. We actually wanted four to six. We tried to stop at six, didn't do anything permanent. Got us a sense of humor. We have seven kids. <laughs> okay. And so there's our family picture. Uh, you can probably count. There's more than seven there. Uh, our three sons are married, so their spouses are in that uh, picture as well. And then our two grandbabies are in that picture. So we feel very, very blessed. It's interesting, though, when they're all young, because we had seven kids in nine years. Yeah, my, my wife's a saint, okay? A hundred percent, there's a special place in heaven for her, okay? Seven kids in nine years. So we go to Walmart or whatever, and you got all these little kids, you know, we got the double, you know, the double cart thing, you know, going on, and they're holding on to the cart, and they weren't allowed to touch stuff, and like, you know, just start picking stuff off the shelves and throwing them in there. So they had to hold on to the cart and everything. And people are like, first they just stare at you, okay? And then if they had enough courage, they, they, they'd come up and, and talk to you, and they go, Hey, like, are you, are you babysitting the whole neighborhood? You know, no, they're, they're all ours. And then they think they're being funny. Like, do, do, do you know what causes this? You know, and my wife, I loved her answer. Every time she'd say, yeah, we're just really good at it. <laughs> Cha-ching. Okay. Uh, so that's who I am. And, uh, and our, we're almost empty nesters. Our kids are now 20 to 29. And our uh, oldest son is a youth pastor at Connection Point over here in west of Indy, if you know that church and familiar with it. And uh, our youngest son is moving next week to be the youth pastor at College Church in Marin, Indiana. And so we feel blessed for that. Three of our kids feel like they're called to medical missions and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and they've been involved already in some of that medical mission stuff. And so we feel really, really blessed. Before I go any further... Let's give it up for the worship team. Thank you. Aaron, you have a beautiful voice. Thank you. Keep singing, girl. It's awesome. So praise the Lord for that. Um, I have the topic of marriage. And, uh, you know, the thing is, um, we're, God created us for relationships. And we're not supposed to live in isolation. We're supposed to live in community. Okay. And um, my four daughters are, are single, and so we're wrestling through that with them, what community looks like, and, and for them to be a part of healthy community. And so even though this is a marriage talk, I want us to, whether you're married or whether you're single or whether you maybe hope to be married one of these days, I want you to think about these principles and connect it to your context, okay? Because I think these principles can apply across relationships completely, Okay. So God has created us for relationships, and first and foremost, he has created us to have a vertical relationship with him, okay? And then he's created us to have a horizontal relationship with each other, especially inside the body of Christ. Like, we are supposed to have community and fellowship 
with one another. And I think it's important, especially with, um, in this day and age, with so many issues and so many problems and, and a lot of emotional. Hey, Josh, welcome, man. Glad you're here, bro. <laughs> okay, we talked about Iowa when you weren't even here, man. You, you could give me a shout out or something, you know. Okay, that's good. Uh, you made it. Way to go, buddy. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, sorry, I digress. Um, but we have a lot of emotional, mental health issues today, and we need each other. Like, this is just reality. We need one another, and we need each other to lock arms and to encourage one another. And so as God has created us for these relationships, I want us to think about, like, um, what is the purpose of life? Okay? And the purpose of life, according to the Westminster Catechism, is this, to bring glory to God and to enjoy Him forever. Therefore, the purpose of any relationship is to bring glory and honor to God. And healthy relationships are those that honor God and honor the, and honor the other person. 1 Corinthians 10 31 says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Now, I work in a college setting. <laughs> Okay, and uh, you know, there's people that are connecting often, and they've got a lot of hopes, and they've got a lot of dreams, and they're constantly asking, is this the one? If you remember your college days, you remember you're asking those same kinds of questions, is this the one? Well, one of those people in my current program right now is Alex Lawrence. His parents attend this church, and you know, and Alex is dating a little girl, Katie, and they're like, They're all excited. And so they come and talk to me often, and they're asking me all kinds of questions. And one of the things I tell them all the time is this. In this process of trying to figure this out, you have to honor God in this relationship and honor the other person. And even if you're not meant to be and the relationship ends, you can walk away with a clean heart and a clean conscience because you're honoring God the entire time. And honoring the other person. You did nothing to disrespect them. Wow. That's huge. So as we talk about marriage and we talk about love, what is love? Okay. And a group of professionals, you know, thought it'd be wise to ask, you know, maybe some four to eight year olds what love is. Because sometimes their answers are pretty profound. Okay. So Listen to some of these answers. Here's Rebecca, age eight. When my grandma got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandpa does it for her now all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. And that's love. Isn't that precious? How about Carrie, age five? Love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. (laughs) That's that's awesome. (laughs) Yay, me. Thank you for that feedback. <clears throat> Emily, age eight. Love is when you kiss all the time. Then when you get tired of kissing, you still want to be together and you talk more. My mommy and daddy are like that. They look gross when they kiss. <laughs> That's what my kids said too. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, um, Bobby, age seven. Love is what's in the room when with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and just listen. What in the world? Like, this is crazy. Noel, age seven, says, love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt and then he wears it every day. (laughs) I've worn this for the last seven days. My wife said she liked it, so I'm going to keep wearing it. How about this one? Chris, age seven. Love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he's handsomer than Brad Pitt. Love is when mommy sees daddy on the toilet and doesn't think it's gross. <laughs> the winner, a four-year-old whose next-door neighbor was an elderly man who had just lost his wife. And when the, when the child saw the man on his porch and he was crying, he crossed the street into the man's yard, up his porch, and he just crawled into his lap. And over time, he sat there for a while and finally came back home and his mom said, what? What did you, what did you do, tell him? He said, nothing. I just helped him cry. That's precious. That's love. 
So let's look at scripture. We're going through Ephesians, right? We're going through Ephesians chapter 5. So turn in your Bibles, whether it's a physical Bible, whether it's a Bible on your phone or whatever it might be, turn in the Word as we go through Ephesians. And Andy gave me Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 32. We're going to read that and then we're going to talk about it. And uh, in the heading of your, uh, of your Bible, it might say um, husbands and wives, or it might say a Christian household, or something like that. And so um, we're going to read that out loud. Okay, Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives... Submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with the water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. I got a couple quick thoughts about this passage, and then we're going to dive into it more deeply. I think today we struggle with the word submit. And I think, men, sometimes we can take this word and this passage out of context at times. And sometimes we're tempted in the midst of an argument. Sometimes we're tempted to say, woman, submit. Oh, wow. For every woman in this room, what did that feel like? Okay. I mean, was that like, you know, fingernails on a chalkboard? Was that abrasive? Did you want to come up here and slap me? I mean, what did that feel like? Probably not too good. Word of the wise, guys, don't say that. Okay, just saying, okay? Don't say that. There's times you might think, that don't, but don't, don't let it come out of your mouth. In fact, don't even think that, okay? And I think sometimes in, in some of our, our, our translations, we have the, um, what we do is we have the, sometimes this heading and this, this, this text begins in verse 22, and sometimes the heading begins in verse 21, okay? And I think whenever you're studying Scripture, what we should do is we need to find out, like, when we look at a passage of Scripture, where does this kind of begin and where does it end? And I think this text, this context, begins in verse 21, which it reads, it's really interesting, submit to one another out of reverence, for Christ. Submit to one another out of reference to Christ. So what does this mean? I think this means that God is more interested in healthy relationships than authoritarian leadership. Can I get an amen? So how does this play out? I think we need to lean into each other's spiritual gifts talents and God-given personality. Now, let me explain how this plays out in our relationship and in our family. My my wife's name is Esther. So let's, let's kind of, I'm going to talk through this a little bit. And this is what it means to compliment one another. In other words, my wife, Esther, she has the spiritual gift of discernment. Okay. And when she discerns something, I have learned to lean into that and follow her leadership and almost 100% she is correct. Why would I not follow her leadership when that is her spiritual gift? Discernment is what God has given her. And it's something that is, she's an image bearer of God's giftedness of this spiritual gift of discernment. Therefore, I want to follow her as she is discerning. Another thing that, that God has given her is she has the talent of organizing thoughts and events. I don't. 
She organized my thoughts for the sermon. I appreciate this talent and gladly accept her skills. Esther has the personality that pursues excellence in all that she does. Does it drive me crazy at times? Yes. However, I know if I die to my pride and lean into her personality, she makes things way better. I have the spiritual gift of faith. When I sense God moving us in a certain direction, I don't doubt. Therefore, she trusts my leadership in this. I have the talent of being a visionary leader. Therefore, when I come up with crazy ideas for our family, and I have a bunch of them, she defers to me and willingly participates. I have a personality of being an achiever. Therefore, Esther allows me to go after huge goals and supports and helps me along the way. She uses her skills to refine those goals and even gives me some action steps on how to achieve those goals. You see how that plays out? We are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Christ has given us certain gifts and talents and a personality and we can lean into each other and we can compliment one another. I like that. On the other hand, let me ask you this question. And this even goes both ways. Ladies, what if, what if there's a man who loves you? Like Christ loves the church. Willingly giving of himself. Thinking of your needs before his. Being a servant leader as he tries to follow Jesus. Denying himself so that he can meet your needs. A man who's chasing after God and you trust his relationship with Jesus. Would you not be willing to come under that leadership? And vice versa. This is the beauty of Scripture. This is how it's supposed to play out. And yet, we struggle with it, don't we? I ain't lying. Right? We struggle with our own pride. We struggle with our own selfishness at times. And that is the battle in all relationships. Pride tanks relationships. But humility wins the day in relationships. Man, just think about like, John the Baptist, and you know he had all these discipleships, disciples, and people were coming out in the wilderness to, you know, see this crazy dude, you know, and and and, and he was re- he was baptizing a bunch of people, and he had these strong messages of repent, and he had all these followers, and then Jesus comes on the scene, and John the Baptist even baptizes Jesus, and then people started following Jesus, and, and someone kind of felt sorry for John the Baptist, so he said, "Hey, are you doing okay? Like, are you all right?" And I love what he says. He says, he says. Um, I must decrease and he must increase. Don't we have to do that even in our relationships? Like it's about dying to self. And the crazy thing that I've discovered in marriage is, is man, God refines me like crazy in marriage. And it exposes my selfishness. It exposes my pride. It exposes my sin. And if the Holy Spirit does it, my wife does. Can I get an amen from that? Thank, thank you. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. Right? And then when you think you've died completely, you have children. And you go to a whole other level of death to self. It's crazy. So, here's the question. Are we bringing glory and honor to Christ through this process? Are we honoring God and honoring one another. So husbands, here's the challenge. It says four times in this passage, in in this text, it says four times, husbands, love your wives. And then specifically, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Give your wife unconditional love, whether she deserves it or not. Think about how Christ loved the church. What does this mean? 
Christ willingly laid down his life for the church. He selflessly sacrificed for the church. He met the needs of the church before his own desires or needs. He protected and provided for the church. This type of unconditional love speaks to the heart of every woman. A woman needs to feel valued, treasured, adored, and loved in this way. It speaks to her worth as a wife, as a woman, as a child of God. And guys, we can't do this in our own strength. This is supernatural. You can't try harder. It's spirit-led and it's spirit-given. It's a quote from John Eldridge. He wrote a book called Wild of Heart, and this is what he says. He says this, The deep cry of a little girl's heart is, Am I lovely? Every woman needs to know that she is exquisite, exotic, and chosen. This is core to her identity. The way she bears the image of God, she asks, will you pursue me? Do you delight in me? Will you fight for me? And like every little boy, she has taken a wound as well. This wound strikes right at the core of her heart of beauty and leaves a devastating message with it. No, you are not beautiful and no one will really fight for you. Ever felt that way? Shame on me if my daughters feel this way. We have a saying in our house. One really good hug from dad every day keeps the bad boys away. My daughters need that. They need that kind of unconditional, selfless, love oh we celebrate valentine's day i go all out for my daughters and my wife if my wife feels that way shame on me god forgive me and this isn't easy but with god All things are possible. So how do we practically do this? What does this look like? I'm going to fly through some stuff, okay? If you're a note taker, get after it, okay? (laughs) Okay, and and guys, trust me, if you're not taking notes, your wife is, okay? (laughs) So (laughs) here we go. Number one, men, pursue your wife. Delight in the wife of your youth. Be captivated by her beauty, Fight for her. Love her unconditionally. To date her regularly. Even half the time, make the plans. Secure the child care. What? Alternate who plans the date nights or anniversary, Valentine's. Go on vacation, just the two of you. Alternate who plans some of those days on vacation. I mean, I know what Esther's ideal day is. It is to have devos together in the morning, then have sex, lay out in the sun. Oh, that's hard. Exercise and then read a good book together. My ideal, you know, day together, she knows what it is. Have sex first, (laughs) then have devos together. Um, go do something, amusement park, water park, then have sex, and then a steak meal, like a good, juicy steak, then go to like a Pacers game, and then end the night with, thank you. She knows. So do you. (laughs) Third thing, make her feel special. Let her know you're thinking of her throughout the day with a phone call, a text message, an email, a note, a flower, etc. 
four. Serve her. I was on the roll the other day. Before she got home from work, I did all the dishes. I did two loads of laundry. Yeah. I mean, she came and she's like, what happened? Who stole my husband and where is he? But man, sex was good that night, let me tell you. (laughs) I'm joking. No, I'm not. Vacuum the house, mop the floor, maybe, maybe watch a rom-com together, you know, a chick flick. Okay, it's really going out, got a lot, guys. Number five, love and lead your kids. Nothing melts her heart more than to see you loving your children. Read to the children, help them with homework, lead the family devotions, discipline and disciple your children. Don't do one without the other. Discipline and disciple your kids. Number six, resolve conflict. Take the time to communicate effectively on the front end, which eliminates most of the conflict. And the sisters are saying, amen, brother. Let's go. Guys, sometimes we're challenged with communication. And, you know, Esther had to teach me how to communicate. Oh, I could maybe get up and preach, but to communicate really well, you know, there's things that were in my mind that I just would not communicate verbally. She said, I can't read your mind, you know. And then there's something, guys, that we actually go to. It's called the nothing box. And she says, what are you thinking about? And she, you say nothing. And ladies, that actually exists. I know you can't fathom that, but it actually is a thing. You know, you're going on a date night or celebrating your anniversary, and she's like, oh, Oh, honey, this is so good to be away, away from the kids and alone. This is awesome, a weekend together. What are you thinking about? Uh, nothing. (laughs) What? Communicate. Learn to talk. Learn to communicate effectively. Then, stay calm. (laughs) Don't raise your voice. Fight fair inside of the conflict. Actively listen without trying to fix her. Oh, that's a challenge, guys. And then write this down. Resolved conflict done in a healthy way creates intimacy. We say it again. Resolved conflict done in a healthy way creates intimacy. In other words, your relationship is worth resolving what you're going through right now. Don't ignore it. Don't sweep it under the carpet. Don't act like it doesn't exist. Don't think it's a competition that you have to win the argument because you'll be sleeping on the couch. It's not a competition. It's not about who wins. No, it's a collaboration. Working together to what? Make your your marriage better. For why? To honor Jesus. That's why. Seven, guard your eyes. Guard your eyes. Stay away from porn. Stay away from other women. Be vigilant about guarding this. Job 31.1 says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a woman. I made a covenant with my eyes Not to look lustfully at a woman. I pray often, God, give me eyes for one woman, my wife. And help me and guard those eyes faithfully and diligently. Right? Decide to love her every day. Love is a decision. It's not just an emotion. Choose to love and tell her often, I love you. I am so glad I married you. Thank you for saying yes. Love her unconditionally, whether she deserves it or not. Nine, be the spiritual leader of the family. Take the initiative with family devotions, praying and scripture reading. Model Christ's likeness before your kids. Pray for your wife. Pray together. And spiritual leadership moves across all the intimacy domains. Emotional intimacy 
spiritual intimacy, physical intimacy, intellectual intimacy. It moves into all that. And I can remember early on in our life, and I was a youth pastor, and, and uh, we, were, we were probably married for like six months. And you know that moment that you're lying in bed, and you've kind of stopped the conversation, and, but you know you're still awake? Both of you are still awake? And I hear my wife do this. <sighs> she takes the deep breath. Guys, do you know what that means? It's coming. Okay? Just brace yourself. It's coming. All right? So, you know, I kind of tensed up. I'm like, what's it coming? You know, what's she going to say? And she simply said, I wish we would pray more together. That's all it was. I wish we'd pray more together. I'm like, ah, how can I lead a church and lead spiritually in one context, but not in another? God rebuked me. So we made a plan. Here was our plan. It's like, you know what? Let's just read scripture together out loud together and we'll pray together. And so for the next four years, we read through the Bible every year for the next four years. We read it out loud together and we discussed it. That takes time. It takes a lot of time to discuss it and then to pray over it. And what I discovered is she has such, inc- remember, spiritual gift of discernment, incredible spiritual insights. I was like, where did you get that? It's like, see the connection here and there and there? I'm like, oh my goodness, like, Wow, you should be the pastor. I'll stay home with the kids. You know, amazing. And that fostered the spiritual intimacy that we needed and got our marriage off to a better start than previously. And, and now today, one of my favorite things is, is to, uh, she loves to cuddle, right? And so one of my favorite things, and it took me a while to get used to that, you know, because just your arm just goes limp. It goes dead. You know, it's just like, I can't feel it any longer. And I can't sleep like this. And she's just like, I'm like, uh, uh. You, know, you know what I'm talking about, guys, right? So one of the things I love to do now is just to wrap my arms around her when we're in bed and just pray for her. And you know how I know things are good? Is when she falls asleep during my prayer. Why? She feels protected spiritually. And we're all good. That's amazing. At first I was offended. I'm praying. You're falling asleep. And then I realized why she was able to fall asleep. Brother, let me tell you, if she can't fall asleep, there is something wrong and she's going to tell you about it. So be thankful she falls asleep when you're holding her and you're praying for her. We've done all kinds of stuff with our kids. For us, it was family devos at the at the dinner table, and and our you know it's cra- it's crazy life when you got seven kids, especially when they're teenagers. It doesn't stop. I think at one phase of life, we had somewhere between twelve and seventeen basketball games a week. Yes, this doesn't count practices. Twelve to seventeen basketball games a week. You divide and conquer. You still can't get to all of them. You're just pawning off your kids to your friends and somebody else can you watch our kids can you take them to this tournament can you whatever it's crazy but even in that we had we had dinner and devotions together probably at least five out of seven nights a week we just were committed to it that might be at five o'clock at night it might be nine o'clock at night we're just gonna be committed to it and we did all kinds of different stuff you know from the children's bible stories right to when they get older you just can read scripture to reading books together and the chronicles of narnia or whatever the case might be but just pouring into, and we would decide together as a, as a husband and wife, as a team, how are we going to disciple our children? What does that look like? How can we do this? And now it's like, how can we disciple our grandchildren? What does this look like? And you know what? I thought parenting stopped when they got to 18 and they like moved out of the house where empty nests was like, woo! Oh my goodness, the questions just get harder and more complex and different. And it's like parenting adult kids is way harder than when they're all like toddlers. Just, just you wait. Amen. Josh. That's twice I called out your name. Here's the question. Are you bringing glory and honor to Christ through this process of loving your wife just as Christ loved the church? Are you honoring God and honoring your wife? Here's the interesting thought 
about this passage of Scripture. It never says, wives, love your husbands. Four times it says, husbands, love your wives. It never gives that commandment. What does it say at the very end of that passage? Wives, respect your husband. I think this speaks to the core, the core need for men. Men want and desire to be respected. I think also this is even my tendency. If I'm at work and and I'm getting a lot of kudos from my boss and great job, way to go the extra mile, you hit it out of the park, way to go, here's a promotion, here's a pay increase, here's a bonus or whatever, and we feel respected at work, no wonder we want to throw ourselves into that and we can become a workaholic. Add achiever personality to that, deadly combination. Men so desire to be respected. Man, you look on the playground, basketball court, and man, there's a fight about ready to happen if if a man feels disrespected. Trust me, I've seen it over and over and over again. And so what does that look like? Just as we are to submit to one another out of reverence for God, we are also instructed to give unconditional respect to others. 1 Peter 2.17. Now, I'm going to pause here for a second. As we dive into this, my wife was going to, we're going to do some team teaching and she was going to come. And and then uh, when she learned, one, this is going to be, you know, like, it's going to be an audio tape of this. She's like, whoa, this is going to be tough. I got it. And then when she learned it's going to be like online and videotape, she's like, I'm out. No, not doing that. Okay. So I, as I go through this, I want you to know she wrote this. I did not. Don't shoot the messenger. Okay. I'm just giving what my wife wrote. Okay. So here it is. She says, however, the fact that wives are specifically instructed to respect their husbands gives emphasis to the fact that men need this for a healthy marriage. This type of unconditional respect, which we usually don't hear that. We hear about unconditional love, right? We don't hear about unconditional respect. So here's what she writes. This type of unconditional respect drives to the core of every man. It speaks to his worth as a husband and child of God. There are different types of respect. We typically think of respect as something earned or in response to what someone has done. But this isn't the respect that Scripture is talking about here. She writes, think about a child who misbehaves. Do you no longer love that child? No, you go into correction, you go into discipline, but you still love that child unconditionally. And, 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 And she goes on and says, that's the same thing with your husband. Not that he's a child, but that if he does something stupid, you still show respect. So in the same way, respecting your husband means you accept them for who they are, even when they're different from you or you disagree with them. And then she says, respect builds feelings of trust, safety and well-being, which are all necessary for healthy relationships. And she goes on, respect is recognizing your husband's intrinsic value due to being created in God's image and expressing that value through your words or actions. And how do we practically do this? Number one, guard your heart. It belongs to God first. Have your identity in Christ. Continue to grow by being in the word and prayer daily. Regardless of whether your husband leads spiritually in the home or not, you are responsible for your spiritual growth and closeness to the Lord. Respect doesn't always come naturally. It's harder in some situations than others. You desperately need God's help. If you focus on what is irritating, you may not respond well. So focus on Jesus and allow the fruit of the Spirit to strengthen and guide you. Then you have the resources to respond in a respectful, loving way through every season of life. Number two, guard your mouth. 
have a filter. It's often not what you say, it is how you say it, when you say it, why you say it. It's a condescending voice. Oh, treat us like one of the kids. Oh. I can remember one time I was working. I had like about 125 employees and I came home one time and I was kind of like, you know, like giving instructions or orders. And she just said, Eddie, I'm not one of your employees. I'm like, thank you, God, for that rebuke. The same thing. Your husband's not one of your kids. So be aware of your tone of voice, your timing, your motive. Great advice at our wedding. Uh, one of our youth sponsors came to us and says, there's three words that you need to say every day. That is, I love you. And we're like, oh, okay. And then he went on and says, and leave about ten things left unsaid every day. Ten hurtful things. Leave them unsaid. And my wife says, and now I would add, say thank you for something every day. Next, be quick to apologize and be quick to forgive whether or not they deserve it or even ask for it. Four, get rid of or rein in sarcasm because sarcasm can be brutal. Five, communicate in healthy ways. Nagging is, she's writing this, not me. Nagging is not one of those ways. If there's something that drains the life from a man, it is a nagging wife. Proverbs 21.9, Proverbs 25.24. A quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy day. Six, instead encourage your husband. Communicate what you are pleased or appreciate about them. Even Jesus needed to hear that God was pleased with him. How much more do our husbands need to hear that, speak life to them and about them, which leads us to speak well about your husband in public. There's, it's just the temptation for women to get together and then the conversation sometimes eventually rolls around to dissing our husbands. So speak well of your husband in public to your friends, to your family, especially to your children, and model and train them to respect their dad. One of the things that my wife did that was so amazing is she trained our kids that when I would open the front door and come home from work is that they would come run. She would say, Daddy's home, and that was like their cue, okay? It's like Pavlov's dog or something, you know? <laughs> Daddy's home, and all seven would come running and just running to me and just basically gang tackle me, Okay? And it was awesome. And then we're rolling on the ground. We're playing. We're laughing. And I'm just thinking, man, what man doesn't want to come home to that? She knew that. Right? She knew that about me. That I needed that. And so she trained our kids to kind of give me that welcome, that greeting. It was beautiful. And by the way, our sons are learning how to treat their future wife by how we men are treating their mom. And our daughters, men, are learning how they're supposed to be treated by how we treat them and love on them. And it's a humbling process. Number three, guard your minds and emotions. It's hard for me to read when tears are draining down my face. So, Guard your mind and emotions. Have boundaries. Don't get emotionally entangled with another man. It's called emotional adultery. Don't be alone with a man other than your husband. Don't use romance novels to escape reality. They can create unrealistic expectations or it's a woman's porn. Take control of your thoughts, ladies. Between the messages our society gives and the lies from Satan, which often go hand in hand, we must take every thought captive and choose to have the mind of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We take every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Last, guard your friendship. 
have fun. Be a student of your husband. Know his personality type. Know his love languages. Love him in a way he can receive. Consider identifying his love language, whether it's encouraging words, gift giving, physical touch, quality time, acts of service. Esther knows that my love language is words of affirmation. And she encourages me often in meaningful ways. Learn about his interests and passions and go do them with him. Go golfing with him or at least riding the cart with him. Watch a war movie with him. Sit down and watch Sports Center with him. Go fishing. Play tennis. Ah, go play pickleball. That's my new thing. Men love action. Go be active with him. And then she writes, which brings us to many husbands' favorite activity. Huh. Guard the marriage bed. Guard the marriage bed. I'm reading her words. Bless my wife. Have sex often. That's what it says. Be aware of and respect your husband's needs. God has designed him with this need. Make it a priority. Remember Hebrews 13, 4, 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5. Your bodies are not your own. So here's the question. Are you bringing glory to God and honor to Christ through this process of respecting your husband? Are you honoring God and honoring your husband? So, does this really work in marriages? Like, does this, this love and respect thing, does, does this really work? I mean, let me share some research with you. This is like crazy research, okay? And it kind of sums up some of the things we're talking about here. Here's what um, they've discovered in research. I mean, we know that about 50% of all marriages end in divorce. It's it actually the, the divorce rate has been going down in recent years. Unfortunately, that is not because we're becoming more faithful to our spouses. It's because a thing called cohabitation. Okay? So, uh, but some research has been done, and um, by the way, that statistic is not very different inside the church and outside the church, by the way, which I think is sad. So, there's some people that had problems with these stats, so they went and did some further research, and here's what they discovered. You know the whole story that a family that prays together, thank you. So, if you pray together on a regular basis as a couple... If you open up the word at least three times a week together, and if you have sex at least twice a week, the divorce rate is one and 1,032. I'm just thankful there's 1,032 couples doing that. In other words, it's almost non-existent. God knows what he's doing. He has created us as men and women and very differently. Thank you, Jesus. Our world wants to say we're the same. We are not the same. We are very different. And you know and you understand that if you are married. You get that. And as he responds to us and reaches out to us through his word of this idea that men are supposed to love their wives like Christ loved the church. This speaks life into her. And as he understands how he's created men and that we need respect, and he, he calls out wives and women to respect their husbands, this speaks truth and life into us. And it works. It works. Oh, we're not perfect in how we play that out, right? We are human and, 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 and we fail often. But here's the thing. God is not asking for perfect marriages. Here's what he's asking. He's asking for healthy marriages. That's what he's asking for. And I really believe in our messed up world, in our crazy messed up world, I think one of the ways we can be an unbelievable witness to the world is actually having a healthy marriage. Or how about this, a healthy family. 
I really believe that. So, what's the challenge? It goes back really to the Westminster Catechism. To bring glory to God and to enjoy Him forever. And can we do that in our relationships? Can we do that in our friendships? Can we do that in our marriages? Can we do that in our parent-child relationships? Can we really bring glory to God and enjoy Him forever? As Aaron comes to lead us in worship or close this app, close this service out, um, can you just stand with me real quick? And my challenge is this. Like, we're not perfect, right? If God's just impressing upon your heart um, that you desire this idea of love and respect and desire to shoot for that, or one of these days you want to have a marriage like that, or even right now if you're single and you want to have relationships in which you are in that process of really understanding what love and respect means, can you do me a favor? If that's just your heart's desire, just raise your hand. It's my heart's desire. I'm learning. I'm growing. And sometimes I'm struggling. Oh, did we fight this week? Yes. Of course we did. I want to preach on marriage. Of course we did. It's what Satan wants to do, right? But if we can resolve that conflict in a healthy way, it creates intimacy. And God is glorified and he's honored. Something else this week I want to share with you because we're the church, we're the body. You don't know me. I mean, most of you met me for the first time this morning. Okay. My mom. home to be with Jesus this week she died on Wednesday she was 99 years old bless her heart like mom couldn't you just get to 100 come on like what's the deal that's the achiever of me we started talking as kids but we said you know when does life begin? At conception. She would have turned 100 April 8th in how we count. But how God counts, she was way past 100. She's about 107 months. Wow. That is a long life. Praise God for my mom and dad. You taught me to love Jesus at a young age. Thank you, God. Thank you that this is not our home. Oh, my goodness. Heaven's our home. Amen. I want to say amen to that. Heaven is our home. We are aliens. We are foreigners in this world. We are placed on this earth to be ambassadors for Christ. This is not our home. Thank you, Jesus, for taking mom home. Reuniting her with dad and other loved ones. Thank you, Jesus, for a life well lived. I will officiate her funeral on Friday. And I'm excited. These aren't tears of sadness. These are tears of joy. 
Folks, that is the hope we have. That is the promise given. On Wednesday at 3.12 p.m., we were singing songs of praise and worship as my mom took her last breath. And she entered into heaven with angels singing praise and worship. And I guarantee you, it was a lot better. And she got to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in, for great is your reward. Amen. Bow your heads with me. If you don't know what that means to put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, and if you would like to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, and if you want to punch that ticket to heaven and say, you know, this is not my home either. I want to have my home in heaven. If you need some hope this morning that this life is not just it, this is but just a drop in terms of eternity we're here today gone tomorrow but eternity is forever that we get to spend forever with you Jesus thank you but if you want that hope this morning you can have it put your trust and faith And Jesus, he alone saves. Thank you. If you want that hope, if you want to put your faith and trust in Jesus alone, can you just raise your hand real quick? Thank you. Thank you. Dear Jesus, our hope is in you. It's not in this world. It's in you. And God, I'm thankful that our life is not just, this is not just it when it comes to life. (sighs) We are like just some little spray bottle. And when we spray it and we see that water and it just kind of eventually goes to the ground, we are just, our lives are like that. Here today, gone tomorrow. But we have the hope of eternity. And we thank you for that, dear Jesus. And we praise you for that. And God, we just ask that everybody here and everybody watching online, that they would place their hope and trust and faith in you and that that we can have this hope of eternity. And that this is not our home. Our home is destined to be with you. And and, and that this this is not it. This is not the finality. That we get to spend eternity with you. And we are thankful for that. But while we're here, may we be ambassadors for your kingdom. I thank you for this truth. And thank you for these promises. In Jesus' name.